JWST's first deep field image gave us a beautiful vista, extreme gravitational lensing, images of the tiniest, faintest and most distant objects ever observed, and even spectra of ancient galaxies. But what have we learned about this patch of space since the preview image was released early? So the official release of the first JWST images was July 12th, 2022, but this deep field shot was actually given out a day early by the White House in America. I covered this image in a video that you can see by clicking up here or with the link in the description. But now I wanna cover all the things we've learned since then. With the official reveal, we got another image of the deep field from a different instrument on board the telescope. And we also got some spectra of objects here as well. Let's start with the spectra, but stick around as we'll cover that second image of the deep field too. And why not subscribe while you're here so you don't miss future videos. First of all, JWST pointed nearest its wide field slitless spectrograph at the galaxy cluster. And it confirmed what we'd all guessed anyway, that the extreme gravitational lensing is showing the same objects multiple times. Let's zoom in here. We see these two smudges of galaxies and we all assumed it was the same galaxy repeating just by how it looked. We now know this is totally true, it's been confirmed, because the spectra of the two smudges are exactly the same. The power of NEARIS is it takes spectra of every object in its field of view at the same time. In this case, this includes these repeated images. The spectrograph then spreads out the light it receives to examine exactly how much of each wavelength it saw. We can see here the spectra of the two objects are exactly the same. The exact same amount of each wavelength and this tells us it's the same object. In particular, the peaks highlighted here are ionized oxygen and atomic hydrogen. The wavelengths that we see these peaks at are the wavelengths of light that these chemical elements emit. And we can also use this information to learn that the light from this galaxy was emitted 9.3 billion years ago. Remember, since NEARIS takes spectra of every object it can see, even if the teams involved aren't intending to study a particular galaxy, they may make surprise discoveries anyway with all this data. Next, using another spectrograph on board called NEARSpec, the Near Infrared Spectrograph, we saw evidence of the various ages of the galaxies pictured. This spectrograph isn't a wide field one like NEARIS, but rather it has slits and shutters, over 248,000 tiny doors that it can open and close in order to focus on over 150 objects at the same time. Here, Nurspec looked at 48 galaxies simultaneously, taking spectra of each of them. Using these spectra, we can then identify specific peaks that appear in all of them. Here, we have a line that corresponds to hydrogen, followed by two lines corresponding to ionized oxygen. We see the same set of lines in all four of these example spectra, but they're in different places along the spectra. Where the pattern falls tells us the redshift of the galaxy that it was emitted from. Redshift is the stretching of the wavelengths of light due to the expansion of the universe and the motion of the galaxy too. So the lines will always be emitted at the same wavelength, but over time, the wavelength gets longer as it travels through the universe, stretched by the expansion. The further away the galaxy is, the longer the light travels for, and the more it gets stretched as a result. So the further to the right the lines are here, the more distant the galaxy is and the higher the redshift. The examples shown here range in age from 11.3 billion years all the way back to 13.1 billion years, making these galaxies some of the most distant ever observed. The final spectra we saw was a more detailed breakdown of this most distant one. At an age of over 13 billion years and a redshift of 8.5, it's one of the most distant spectra we've ever seen. Of course, Webb will smash that record again and again, very quickly. We can again see the hydrogen and couple of oxygen lines we had before. They're by far the biggest and most obvious, they don't even fit on the axes here. But now we can also make out shorter lines that correspond to neon and other instances of hydrogen and oxygen. This is telling us about the composition of a galaxy and its stars from when the universe was really an infant. We're learning about the formation of the earliest galaxies, and this can in turn teach us about how they evolve and compare to the more nearby spirals and ellipticals we see in the modern universe. As promised, let's also dive into this image. The exact same scene, but taken in mid-infrared light using MIRI. Obviously, there seems to be much less visible here, and what we can see doesn't seem to be nearly as bright. This is because stars, and hence galaxies too, are much brighter in shorter wavelengths of light. So switching to mid-infrared from near-infrared brings a noticeable change and decrease in brightness. There's also the reduction in resolution that comes with longer wavelengths as well. 
For example, this blobby galaxy here, which I think we've all collectively decided to call the Dali galaxy, has way more structure and detail in the NERCAM image. The stars too have much smaller spikes here, telling us that we received less light in this wavelength and they look more like blue snowflakes rather than huge spiky beasts. The blue spikeless objects are almost all galaxies that contain very little dust, while the redder ones tend to be shrouded in a lot more of that dust. We also see a surprising number of green galaxies, which we don't see in the NERCAM image, telling us these galaxies are full of hydrocarbons and other chemical compounds, and these will be hotbeds for future research, so we can start to understand these galaxies more. Finally, I just want to show you this website where you can slide between the new web image and the older Hubble image of the cluster. I'll leave a link in the description and it's a really fun and interactive way to see the differences. Pick a distant red galaxy and watch it disappear in the Hubble data. Or pick a Hubble galaxy and watch all of its structure and detail reveal themselves in the web image. You can also see the stars go between four and six diffraction spikes due to the different setups of the telescopes. And I have a full video on exactly why the JWST images have six spikes, which you can check out if you're interested. Shoot me any questions you have down below and I'll catch you on the next one. Until then, stay safe team. I'll see you soon. Bye.